竹子对我来说是带领我去接触手工艺、接触传统文化一个很重要的起点。然后透过艺术创作，把那些呃古老的智慧、智慧最宝贵的部分应用在可能是雕塑或者是非常大型的装置艺术，甚至是呃各式各样不一样的应用的可能性。我最喜欢竹子的其中一个很大的特色，是因为它是来自天然的植物。然后另一个原因是因为竹子它对我来说是一个充满变化可能性的材料，它可以是粉末，也可以被抽成细丝，也可以被劈成柔软的竹片，甚至是竹管，甚至是变成一个呃坚硬的固体的状态。然后它从非常细微到非常的庞大。从非常的轻盈到非常的沉重，甚甚至从非常的柔软到有弹性到坚硬。然后他是少主最后一个会做少主鱼泉的一个老人家。然后老先生就非常大方的就就很乐意的来教我们怎么做。然后在制作过程里面，我就可以看到好多很宝贵的知识，像原本以为是怎么，原本以为看到那个作品的时候就以为非常的困难，可是实际在亲手执行一次之后，会发现它的每个编织的方式跟步骤其实都非常聪明跟简单。所以我们就呃想的很单纯、很可爱的一个构想，就是原本这个小小的拿来抓鱼，我们是不是可以把它变得很大呢？让所有。的游客都有机会能够认识这个很美好的、宝贵，而且快要消失的事情。主要是，呃，觉得我们的创作和他们所推崇的手工精神是非常的相近的，而且也充满了历史。这样，那我就会很喜欢用螺丝起子把它们全部一个一个转开，然后零件拆到不能再拆之后，把它摆在地上，像是一个很很工整的画面。然后我再。呃，很像在玩模型一样，我就在试着把它组回去。通常被我组回去的，通常都不能够再使用了。嗯、原来竹子曾经在旧时代里被做成各式各样很美好，甚至很精彩的作品。我一开始接触竹子的时候，我开始先去关注竹子在我的生活里都以什么样的方式出现。然后最大最常看到的就是被做成只用一次的免洗筷，这是在我生活里面最常出现的竹子。只用这样子快速、便宜的消费方式来看它，然后我就很期待说，是不是竹子这个材料在现代能够有一些高附加价值的可能性。对我来说是一个很重要的一个作品，因为它是我第一次去接触呃传统文化，然后还有手工艺的一个起点。材料，师傅教我那样子，那我可不可以用什么样不一样的方式去改变它等等？然后大部分的师傅他们觉得，呃，我做这些变化，他觉得很有趣，但是不知道这这能不能成为一个工作，或是它能不能变成一个能够呃能够现实生活来说能够去销售、能够贩卖、能够赚钱的一个东西。
我刚认识他的时候，就是就是也是乐色话很多的一个人。我我一开始刚看到他，他都不讲话的时候，会觉得他可能有点难亲近。那在这个过程里面，就是时间久了之后，我们可能因为个性蛮合的，所以其实就从工作的伙伴渐渐走到现在六年多，其实也蛮像家人的。我每次看他做出来的东西，你可以很明确的知道机器做不到，然后，所以我觉得他的作品提供很多有趣的思考，都是用最简单的动作，然后去呈现一个地方的老工艺，这是我自己非常喜欢的地方。原来有些，原来鸟类在筑巢的时候，它其实都会有很严谨的一个过程，试着去学习这些鸟类的特定鸟类的筑巢方式。然后我用人类的一些构筑或是一些绳编的方式去重新表现这件事情。来自这个地方，就是从土地里面，每个地方都会长出属于自己的手工艺。然后那个手工艺，它其实会跟环境有关，它会跟当时在这里生活的人们的历史文化有关。然后我觉得我是一个呃艺术创作者，我可以用艺术创作这件事情来留下它，甚至让它能够产生不一样的面貌，重新从呃把这些精彩的老故事用不一样的年轻的属于现代的方法跟人们再说一次。My style is layered, eclectic, bohemian, colourful, full of pattern, a lived-in, cosy feel. My grandmother's house in Kenya is one of the old houses built in Nairobi. She sort of decorated it with a bit of a European influence, with sort of old chintzes and European fabrics mixed with African pieces as well. The style of the house just feels incredibly lived in and layered and old. It doesn't feel like a new house. I live in the house with、uh, my husband Timothy and our three children and our two rescue dogs, Gracie and Blaze. We chose to live here because we liked the old feeling of it and also the big space that it has. It's great for the children running around in the garden and just has a really lovely atmosphere and lots of character. The starting point for Arthur and Gabriella's room, I would say, would definitely be the beds. Always loved bobbin furniture, which is that turn wood which looks like little balls. And I actually saw those beds in one of my suppliers' workshops here, sort of in the corner, covered in dust. And I think I got them for a hundred dollars for the pair. I saw that wallpaper, which I absolutely fell in love with, and I just love the way that each plate has a different animal within it. And actually, I can hear George sometimes sitting in his cot, talking to the animals and pointing at them. I can see him on the monitor, which is so sweet.
I loved the high-pitched ceiling in there, and I painted it blue to give a sort of tented effect. It's just so quiet at night, so all you can hear is the crickets, and it's just lovely. My paternal grandmother was from Scotland, but she was one of the original supermodels in the UK. She was Christiane Dior's muse, and she was on the cover of Vogue and Vanity Fair a number of times. She was also an artist and was very creative. She would take us on painting trips and really encourage that side of things. So yeah, she's definitely influenced my creative side. My favourite place in the house is the sitting room, especially in the morning because it's east facing, you get the sunrise and the light in here is just so beautiful and it's quite peaceful and the bird song is amazing. The best thing about having my studio at home is the convenience. It's just amazing to be able to walk down eight steps and be in my office. When I started working in interior design, it just felt natural from day one. I just loved it. Most of the fabrics that we use in our projects and in my own home are all quite small boutique artisanal brands. I know most of the people who weave and print them personally. I think that creates a really unique look within my projects that no two are the same. I got to know Elizabeth when about two years ago, I was introduced to her by a friend and then engaged her to design my new home. When we worked on my house together, it was very much a collaboration, not so much a formal client and designer relationship, but we were collaborators, co-conspirators, thought partners. My favorite spot in Elizabeth's home is probably the gallery walls in the living room. It says a lot about her core design aesthetic, which is that it's all very collected, everything tells a story. It's not too perfect, it's not too precious or, or too done, but it's transportive as well. The Japanese woodblock prints we've collected over the years in auctions, when we were in Japan. I love the theatrical element of so many of them are scenes from plays. We hung them inspired by Monet. He has in his house outside Paris, he's hung them floor to ceiling throughout his whole dining room. <laughs> we've moved in here with no children. The importance of this house to our lives, it's immense because this is where we went from just being two to being five. I'd say the ATAP we use, especially at the weekends, I mean, we're probably there nearly all day, some days on a Saturday or Sunday. It does feel like you're on holiday when you're out there. The house is such a loved home and it's just got so much personality and character already within it. Since we've lived in this house, we've had couples in their 80s and 70s uh, visit the house unannounced uh, because they had brought up their children in this house and it meant so much to them that they came back to Singapore specifically to visit the house. So, you know, it's given a lot of other people a lot of joy. It's given us a lot of joy. Yeah, when we moved in, there was a message written under the stairs, wasn't there, from the previous family saying, we've loved living in this house so much. We have the best memories and we hope you do too. Which was, yeah, yeah. just... We'll have to leave the same message. Yeah. <laughs> Technique is something that you build through a lot of hard practice. You gotta use every part of your body depending on what kind of pasta you're making. 
you need to know the nuances of how to form or shape a particular pasta. When you go into that level, there's also a differentiation as to good technique and bad technique. To most people, this profession does not exist because to them, chef is chef. I cook only small portions of pasta. Every bite is at its peak. I'm there explaining how it's made, where it's from, why it's made this way, a little bit of history. I will get people to come and to have interactive experience where they touch the pasta dough and they try to make it as well. I wanted to focus on the artistry of pasta making, something that's lacking in the current gastronomic landscape in Singapore. there are maybe five, six hundred documented shapes. And that is actually a good thing because I get bored quite easily. <laughs> it's always kind of a roller coaster in terms of emotions. Every time it's a different experience. There's no history or tradition behind it. It's just something that I wanted to introduce on my menu, but with my own spin. It kind of looks like two AA batteries, if you can imagine. I wanted to make sure there were crevices to catch sauce. You want to have a little bit of the sauce, the dressing, together with the pasta when you eat it. Sufalin deo is gossamer pasta threads set on each other to form like a lattice, so it looks like a woven fabric. It's delicate, so traditionally, it's served in a broth. He took a few months to master it. He has this love-hate relationship with this sufalin deo. Like on some days where he sees progression, he'll be very happy about it. But on other days, he'll be so frustrated and he'll say he hates it. But the next hour, he'll be still working on it. He is that obsessed and patient. This is essentially where I grew up, right until I got married and then moved out. my hero 15 years ago. And his take on Italian food was not snooty. It was very ingredient-based, produce-driven. So very natural, very new at that time. Also, my friend's dad, he was actually the one who inspired me as well to some extent. So we would go to my friend's house and his dad would gather everybody at the table. He would cook really awesome meals. I always remember his uh, roasted chicken. This conviviality, you know, having people at the table and bonding over food. The wine flows and conversations flow, and that got me very interested in host dinners. I saw how unhappy he was with his professional job, so I kept pushing him and encouraging him to do it.
Whenever he rolls out new dishes or he do new experimentations, I've always been his guinea pig. I'm very critical. So he says I'm his best critic. I don't have to give chance one. <laughs> in a sense, I don't need to patronise him and say it's nice. I will give him my honest opinion. And in fact, I think this helps him to improve. Across the years, regardless in touch rugby or in his pastor journey, when he commits to something, he will put in 101% and all the hours. And he has this obsession with perfection. It was actually like his R&D research trip in the name of honeymoon. He will force himself to eat five meals a day just to max out on all the food that he can try. After that trip, I acted on those perspectives and a new experiences that I've gathered by trying my hand at handmade pasta. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the most disastrous experiences because I could never replicate what I had there. It's not just materials, but I should focus more on techniques. I'm extremely proud of what he has achieved, you know, from a nook to slowly a recognised pasta maestro in Singapore. And I think what is even more satisfying is, you know, in the past, he has a lot of recognition from pasta makers all over the world. Like, people that he has been following over the past actually shows their respect for him. So as an artisan, what I do is to keep true to tradition. A pasta dish is not just a chef's effort, but it's a confluence of both the pasta maker as a craftsman and a professional chef in the kitchen that executes the dish itself. 